My name is Robert Stanley Chesson. Mm -hmm. I'm. Could you spell it? Your name. Chesson. C H E double S U M. And I'm what? 94 years of age. But what is your birthday? My birthday is the 27th of May, 24. 24. So you are 94 year old. 94. I don't see many wrinkles from your face. Where did it go? <laughs> They're only supposed to show where smiles have been. Oh. And what happened to your forehead? I fell over and hit my head on the footpath. Oh, are you okay? Yes, I'm When did it happen? On Wednesday. You mean the day before yesterday? Yes. Whoa. I am so sorry to see that, but you look fine. Oh, I'm feeling better now. You want to have something in your face, cosmetic, to, to look nice today. <laughs> 94 year old, you are very, you look very healthy, sir. Well, yeah. I'm still coping. And where were you born? I was born in Walkworth, New Zealand. Could you, could you spell it? W A R K W O R T H. Oh, slowly. W W A R K K W O R T H. O R T H. Workworth. Yes. And it's in New Zealand, right? Yes. Please tell me about your family when you were growing up, your parents and your siblings, when you were growing up and when you were a child. And my parents. We're both British born. They came to New Zealand in 1912 and 1914. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a in a family of five children, uh, three boys and two girls. I was the middle with an older brother and mm. sister and a younger brother and mm. sister. So you were a five-year-old or six-year-old boy when the Great Depression broke out in 1929. Correct. How was it? How was it to live around that difficult time? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. How was it in the middle of a Great Depression when you were growing up? Was it difficult? Well, it was the, Korea, it was the uh, Depression. My father had a small farm mm -hmm. and he was really struggling on the farm and working and there and still went into debt. We, we had a very depressed childhood. Yeah, must be very difficult, right? Very difficult, but uh, he went into debt for four years and then it took four years to get out of debt once the depression was over. Oh. Yeah, it was a difficult time for everybody. Yes, it was. So tell me about the schools you went through. I only went to one school, that was the Walkworth School. I started there at 29 mm. and I left when I was 13 to start work. So 13 is like a 27. No, 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 no. When did you finish your school? Well, that'd be 38, I think. 38. Mm, early 38. And this is the question that I ask to everybody. When you were in school, did you learn anything about Korea? Yes, we, wow. we just learned that it was uh, occupied by Japan. Apart from that, we learned nothing about it. So you knew that Korea was the colony of Japan, but nothing else? Nothing else, yeah. Um, and after you graduated the school in 1938, what did you do? I worked in a store. Store? Yes. Yes. And how was the salary at the time? Fifteen shillings a week. Wow. And with the fifteen shilling, what were you able to buy? Not very much. <laughs> it was a. Uh, uh, you could. It cost one and six and a shilling and a half for a haircut. Uh huh. Uh, a newspaper cost tuppence. 
What about a gallon of milk? How much was it? I wouldn't know. We lived on a farm. We had our own milk. <laughs> you don't need milk to yeah. buy, right? So it was uh, just little. And when did you join the military? Well, uh, at 16, I joined the Home Guard, which was a volunteer part-time thing. I was, at 18, I went into the Army in the ASC. What is ASC? Army Service Corps. Okay. And after about less than a year, I was transferred to the Air Force. Ooh. Why? And uh, Why was, were you transferred? Well, I asked for the volunteer, and those of who weren't volunteer were just shifted anyway. Mm. And so I, I volunteered for air crew. I started training as a pilot. Oh, you were a pilot? No, I, I, I didn't graduate from the elementary course. So I remastered as a wireless operator air gunner mm -hmm. and went to Canada for my training. And? And after the, when I graduated, I was commissioned as a pilot officer. Very good. And then... When was it? That would be in the early 45. No, no, no. Oh, early 45. Yes. yes. So you become the pilot? A pilot officer is a rank equal to second lieutenant. Uh -huh. I, I then went to, from Canada, we went to, by ship to uh, New Caledonia, sat there shortly, and then back to New Zealand. Mm. And and then the war ended very quickly before we got onto operations, and I was discharged from the army, from the air force. And then you were discharged as an army. Yeah. So what happened? Did, you didn't fight. You didn't no, fight didn't during fight the World in the War II. Did all my training for nothing. Lucky. <laughs> very lucky. Yeah. And what happened then? Well, I went back to uh, work, and I was working in New Lynn, in Crown Lynn Potteries. Mm. And I was there until the Korean War started. I was, as soon as the war started, I volunteered. You volunteered? Volunteered, yes. You were not afraid going to war? No. Wow. So and in 19, when did you volunteer? Volunteered with me in, in the war started in 1950, didn't it? So I volunteered almost immediately. I called for volunteers and we went into camp, I think, in about August. August. What camp did you go? I went to the Papakura camp, mm -hmm. did a short uh, identification there, and then down to Waiuru. Mm -hmm. And because I had been Air Force, that I was joined a group of other officers, infantry, Navy, Air Force, etc., mm -hmm. and did a conversion course to artillery. Artillery? Mm. Wow, you've been changing a lot. Yes. Yeah. And after the, the course, I was granted a, a, a first lieutenant's rank mm. and appointed to gun position officer of able troop. So how, what kind of training was it? Wasn't it hard for you to learn all those things well, because was, you were Air Force and was, gun? We, we had to learn all the basic yeah. knowledge of, of artillery. But I mean, it was very, very quick training, rather superficial. Mm -hmm. But uh, by the time we did done the training, we were supposed to be able to 
operators or artillery officers. Mm. Were you married at the time? I was married with two children. Two children? Yes. When did you marry? I married just shortly after I came back from uh, the Air Force. Uh, so 1945? Yes. Huh. And is she your wife that you married? No. no oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you go to Korea? And we left for Korea in November 50, and we landed on New Year's Eve. Mm. Where did you land it? In the Pusan. 1950? Yeah. So you how, tell me when you landed in uh, Pusan, and then you're going around and seeing Korea for the first time, what was your image? Be honest and, you know, candid with me about the Korea you saw for the first time. Well, when we first took a look, we said that whoever lost the war should take over the whole country. Mm. That's what we thought of Korea. At, at, it was a, well, it was in the middle of winter, that, but the whole place appeared poverty-stricken. Mm -hmm. The people looked poor. And uh, there's nothing very impressive about it at all. Mm. So what were you thinking to look at those countries, so destroyed and impoverished and so on? Yeah. What were you thinking? Well, I thought... Did you they, regret? We felt that Korean people had nothing. Uh-huh. And... Yeah. It was... Uh, it was not impressive at all. And from there, where did you go? Well, uh, we spent a short period in Busan yeah. until we were equipped, and then went up to uh, Miryang, I think it was called, Million? where we cal calibrated our guns, mm. and then we were there for a week or so, and then into action. And the first place we went in for action was Changhao Wangni. Uh huh. And, and what the, happened? Who was the enemy? Well, at the we time? were there. At, we were there uh, supporting the twenty seventh uh, Commonwealth Brigade, hmm. Australian, Canadian, and two British regiments. Mm hmm. And at that time, they were, it was a counter-offensive. And so for the next two or three months, we were in a solid advance, moving all the time. And uh, we sort of learned our trade there. I think, uh, we were not very efficient for a start, but by the time we'd been going for a month or two, shifting regularly, the uh, regiment became very very efficient as a mm. artillery unit. So that was early 1951, right? Yes. Yes. And by the time the UN forces went up to North Korea, but they had to come down because of Chinese intervention at the yes. end of 1950. Yes, that had been the Chinese intervention had come and they retreated almost to Busan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then they started the counter-offensive coming yes. north. So what was your role and what did you do? Tell me about the battle where you were positioned and how did it happen to you? Well, for give, our, give us detail. Where was it? Well, uh, we just, just moving steadily north all yeah. the time and that, and that went until we reached um, Kapyong. Kapyong. And, um, yes. By, the, by that time, I had been transferred to be the, uh, the command post office of the battery. And uh, so uh, at the Battle of Kapyong, I was uh, responsible for all the fire programs of wow. the whole battery. So you were still the first lieutenant? 
Yes, till the first lieutenant. But you were in charge of all this battery? Well, the whole battery. I controlled the fire. From the battery command post, I controlled the fire of both troops and coordinated it. And what was your unit uh, of New Zealand Army? Can you well, tell me? Well, it was the 16th New Zealand Field Regiment, mm -hmm. the Royal Artillery. Yep. And tell me about the situation there in Kapyong. How was it? Who was the enemy and how was the battle and what was the kind of situation? Well, originally we were there with Kapyong and the uh, New Zealand and then the Commonwealth troops, infantry withdrew and the area was taken over by a Korean division. And uh, they, we was there to give them fi uh, fire support. Fire support. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when the uh, attack started, the Korean division disintegrated. Oh. They were raw troops and they just there, and the British were rushed in to try and stop the gap. And uh, for the initial start, they withdrew two of the batteries and to give support while they did the, uh, formed a uh, front. And 161 battery stayed forward to support the troops, the rear guard as they came out. Hmm. And, uh, Eventually, once the others got into action, then 161 was withdrawn, which drew, uh, went back and joined the regiment. And then, from then on, we were in one position, supporting the Australians and the Canadians who had formed the front. And that was when the major battle started. And in that three days, the New Zealand regiment fired more shots than any artillery regiment fired in the whole of three years in the uh, Western Desert. Hmm. It was just solid firing and that, and because of the solid firing, the New Zealand, the uh, Australian position was never really threatened. They held the place and uh, they absolutely stopped the attack. Hmm. When well, was it? Was it during the summer of 1951? That was in uh, April 1950, uh, 1951. Yeah. Wow, you remember so much. You have a, such good memory. Well, At the age of 94, I wish I could do that. Yes, well, well uh, I was in such a, a responsible position where I was and the, the things I had to do. Mm -hmm. And so it's... Uh, I remember, it very, I remember it very clearly. Can you reveal some secret? How many cannons did you have, New Zealand uh, regiment at the time, and well, the, how many soldiers were there who was the enemy? Well, Chinese the New Zealand or North regiment Korean? was 24, 25-pounders. But we also had supporting us a uh, one battery of the American 155s, that would be six guns, and there was also a a battery of two eight-inch howitzers, uh, which we could call on for fire mm. if we needed. Do you remember any specific episode? You might have lost your life or dangerous moments during your service there in Kapyong? Well, the nearest to came to danger was... Mm -hmm. Yeah? Danger was uh, when we were f uh, forward because uh, we were waiting for destructions to withdraw and the uh, enemy came closer and closer. Our last the time we fired on them, they were within 300 metres. And they hadn't given warning to move. And so I actually pulled everything out and lined them up ready to go except the guns. And at the last minute, I ordered the guns to move too. And fortunately, the orders to move out came at the same time. Mm. So you had to withdraw? 
Oh, well, well, Washington had to be out of a run. Oh, so Chinese or North Koreans at the time? Enemy. Uh, Chinese. Chinese. Yes. So finally, what happened in that battle of Gapyeong? Did you win or what happened? Well, the, uh, the, 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 it was a win. The Chinese came to a complete halt. Mm -hmm. And they uh, ran, uh, because they run out of the food and ammunition. They come and they, they have about f what they carry with them. And if they don't succeed in the first week, They've stopped. They stopped. They stopped, mm -hmm. and then they can be rolled up. The si on the other side, where the main battle was that we were not in, but at the engine, engine. they actually overran all the British positions there, but they didn't get far enough, and then they were, within a week, they'd recaptured all the ground, they'd lost it. Did you move from Kapyong to Imjin? Well, after that, we moved to Injun because they had to form the uh, first Commonwealth Division. Mm. By that time, that, the Canadian full force was there, and so there was a Commonwealth Brigade, the British Brigade, and and the, and the Canadian Brigade, the three brigades. New Zealand too. And the, the, and the three lots of artillery, the just British artillery the Canadian artillery in New Zealand, and they were com now we were a complete regiment, a complete division. So after you uh, settled down in the Gapyeong, you moved to Incheon, I mean the Imjin River, yeah. and then you form a first yes. Commonwealth Brigade and Commonwealth fight against division, Chinese. Yes. yes. Wow. So you were in the two big battle. Is that you were in the two big battles. No, we, we, I, I, was, I wasn't in the Indian battle. It was, you won? Well, it was fought at the same time as Cap Yong. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Uh, so you didn't move to Imjin? Uh, uh, and when the boat battles were over, that's when we moved across and joined the others. Okay, where did you go? From Where did you go from Cap Yong? Well, uh, it'd be in June. In Chun? In June. Month of June. Yeah, yeah, then. yeah. And where did you go from Kapyong? Went across to the engine. Okay. And uh, we stayed there for, for, for the rest of the war. Mm. So what was it like? Every day routine. You wake, woke up what time and then where did you eat and what did you do and what did you do while you were resting? Things like that. Can you give us a kind of... Uh, Routine of one specific well, typical day. Once we got to engine, engine, it was a routine because it was a static. The uh, position stayed. We never moved again. Well, within that area, and regular patrols over the engine and that, and uh, it was actually just static warfare from then on. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, later, in, Oct in October, they staged a, a, an assault on the Chinese line. Two objectives, two men hills, one five, three five five, and three one seven. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. And you, you were part of those three five uh, five and three one uh, seven. Well, by that time, I was transferred to Fox Troop as a troop commander and my role changed. I was with the infantry as a forward observation officer oh. then. Forward observation. That's a very dangerous, isn't it? Well, it can be. So you did actually patrol with the soldiers together? Yes. But you were first lieutenant at the time? I was, well, I was now a captain. Captain? It, 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 well, Temporary captain. Mm. So you were very high up there, but still you did patrol all those area as a forward observation. Yes. And uh, when they, the offensive started, uh, I went forward with the infantry. The first attack was on a, a hill in the rear of 
355 foot you captain and then the Canadians went up forward and took the hill and the next day we uh, uh, went to uh, 317 and that was also captured mm. and at that time I was wounded and had to be evacuated to, to uh, Japan and at the hospital. Why? You were ended? Wounded? Yes, yeah, not seriously, but just enough to need attention. Uh -huh. and Tell after... me, how, how did it happen? Sorry? How did it happen? Oh, well, just a uh, mortar fire. Mm. And uh, after I'd been a, a week or so in hospital, I was transferred to base camp as the camp commandant at, at Hiro Camp in Japan. Mm. And I stayed there for six months. Mm. And then? And after six months, I went back to Korea. Again? And I was appointed... When was it? Sorry? When was it? When you went back? Uh, March. 1952 March, right? March 50. Uh-huh. I was appointed as battery captain at the 2 IC of 161 Battery. Mm -hmm. And I remained there until Where? October. Where? Still at Capdell. Capdell? No, sorry, no. still at uh, Imgen. Imgen. And then I returned home in October of... Uh, 52. 52. So you were there very long, almost like two years, right? Best part of two years. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and and then I was discharged from the army. I've been back to Korea twice. When was it? I went in the two thousand and four revisit. Mm -hmm. And then two years later, they sent a small party over for the dedication of the uh, New Zealand memorial at, at Pusan. And I was fortunate enough to get chosen to go over that. So tell me, this is very important uh, part of the whole interview. When you went back to Korea in 2004 and 2006, oh, before that, when you were in Korea from 1951 to 52, were you able to see around Seoul? I did go through, uh, uh, I visited Seoul, yes, to, uh, uh, on my way back from uh, Korea. I went through Seoul to get to the uh, battery and saw Seoul. And how was it? Tell me the details. It, well, it was, it was a wreck, wasn't it? There was nothing there. The buildings were the, demolished and... Uh, there's nothing much about it. But when we went back, of course, it was unbelievable. What they there, what the, the number of bridges that had been built across the Han River. And then my roommate at the revisit was an engineer. He designed bridges. And of course, he uh, went and invested, uh, investigated every bridge and he, he was absolutely amazed mm. at what they'd done. What were you thinking when you see all those change done? Huh? Well, it was almost unbelievable what had happened to the country. Mm. The whole country looked like a continual building site. Too many buildings, that is the problem. Yes. It was amazing to see the um, blocks of uh, apartments go up. <laughs> they didn't build a block, one block, they built ten at a time. And they were, and they were f almost alongside with the fields, all the farmers still working in the fields. It was uh, almost unbelievable to see the change. When you left in October 1952, Korea, okay, when you left, had you ever thought that Korea would become like this today? No. Why no. not? Did you underestimate Korean people or what happened? Well, uh, what I mean, having seen how slow anything moves in New Zealand, uh -huh. uh, what I mean that if they wanted to build a road here, 
it takes years to do it. There, they build the road, and uh, within a year, the road is there, because between when I went there one time and the next time, they had virtually opened a new road from Seoul to Busan. Ah. And, and that, uh, the new road was there, and the new rail was there. And because uh, on that second visit, we did uh, went on the uh, uh, the uh, train, yeah, the, it was a rocket train, 300 k's an hour at the time. It was just unbelievable. That's amazing, isn't it? Yes. What was the most difficult thing during your service in Korea? If I ask you to pinpoint among many, one thing that really bothered you or really difficult? Well, the first year was the weather, because it was uh, probably the worst winter they'd had for years. And we were not properly equipped for it. And when were, what was it at the second time that most difficult? What, what do you mean the second time? When you went back from Japan to Korea, right? And you were the cap captain in the... Oh, well, the, the, there were no difficulties at all. Because Not at all. What I mean, we had all our supplies, we had all everything we needed. And it was, um, it was a, quite a, an entirely different situation. Mm -hmm. I preferred the first time when the men were under hardship and that sort of thing. They seemed to be doing something. The second time, it was uh, it was uh, it, the spirit had gone out of the work. Of, the men were not the same. Mm -hmm. Were you able to write a letter back to your wife and children? Oh, well, oh yes, we had regular mails. The mails got through pretty regularly, and they uh, they used the uh, email forms. So it must have been very hard for your wife without you and taking care of two babies at the time. Uh, well, it, uh, those had to be managed all right. Mm -hmm. And did you send the money back to your wife? Well, uh, normally you have make an allotment. You have to all pay, the, and the, they have are paid and for the children, and you pay allotment that goes back to, to subsidize that. Mm. Mm. Now, do you know the rank of Korean economy now in the world? Korean economy, the rank. I'm sorry? Do you know the Korean economy, the rank of Korean economy in the world? No. We are number 11 in the world. No. In terms of GDP size. Number 11, it's uh, ahead of New Zealand. Oh, well, yes, it would be. Uh -huh. What do you think about this whole transformation? You didn't think that Korea would become like this when you left, and now it's the 11th largest economy, most substantive democracy in, in Asia. What do you think about all this transformation? Are you proud? Well, uh, uh, like most members of the Force, we feel we have a stake in it, that we contribute to it, and we're proud to have done so. Absolutely. Yes. But the problem is, not many countries are actually talking about the Korean War in history class. Not in New Zealand either. Not too much. A little bit. And it's been known as Forgotten War. Well, it is the Forgotten War. And we in New Zealand, the Cave Wars men, term ourselves the, the forgotten men of the unknown war. Why is that? Why is it forgotten war? Why does it have to be remaining as a forgotten war despite very good thing came out of your service during the Korean War? Korea become 11th largest economy. It's a beautiful, strong country. Why is it still has to be forgotten war? Well, I don't know, but there was just It was just for, we felt we're forgotten when we came back to New Zealand. We were forgotten. Mm. But I mean, nothing special was done for us when we came back. And uh, 
But now it's special, isn't it? Korea is special because there was nothing vertically standing, not much, when you left Korea. Now it's all high-rise. Yes. It's very special, but still we don't teach. So how do you think we can change that reality in education here in New Zealand? It'd be very difficult because it, uh, it's teaching about wars is not popular in the education mm -hmm, system. Mm -hmm. And um, no one re really wants to know. Mm. Do you, have, you must have a lot of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I've got... How many? Nineteen great-grandchildren. Nineteen only great-great-great-children? Nineteen great-grandchildren. Wow. And are there any teacher in the school? Pardon? Are there any teacher in, uh, in the school among your great-grandchildren? Or children or great-children? Yeah, uh, yes, I've got two or three who are teachers. What do they teach? Well, I don't know much. History? They're just general, they're not specialists. Okay. Uh, if you have any children or great children or great great children teaching history, you let me know because that's what we are trying to do. Not just doing interview here, but we want to make this interview into curricular resources yes. so that teachers can teach about the war that you fought for and make it as not forgotten war. That's what we are trying to do. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Any special episode that you want to share? You, you want to say anything about the war that you fought, fight for? I can only say that I'm proud to be a part of the Korean War, and I'm proud to be part there and one of the greatest things I found was the way the Korean people treated us when we went back. Uh, when uh, we couldn't pay for a taxi, and uh, the, the, the special treatment they gave us when we went anywhere public in Korea. Mm -hmm. and, and, and same in New Zealand. If I meet a Korean person there, some of the strangers, they come and thank me for my service. And uh, we know that the Korean people appreciate us, even if the New Zealand don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs of Republic of Korea running revisit program for the veterans like you so that they can come back and see the changes. Yes. Yes, that's very nice, isn't yeah. it? But we are thankful to your service because you fought for us to give us opportunity to rebuild our nation. So this is how we want to preserve your honorable service. Yes. Now you are with your wife and your nephew? Cousin. Cousin. He's a cousin. His father fought in Korea too. Oh. So please introduce yourself. What is your name? I'm Beverly Chesson. Beverly? Chesson. Yeah. Um, I'm Robert's wife. And when did you marry him? 61 years ago. 61? Yeah. When was, so 16? 1958. We got 58. Mm -hmm. And what about you, sir? Uh, my name's Royce. Royce? My, uh, Bob is my mother's first cousin. Uh -huh. But my father also was in the Korean War. But he died in 2002. What is your last name? Wiles, W-I-L-E-S, Royce Wiles. My father was Lindsay William Wiles, and he was also in the K-Force. L-I-N-D-S-A-Y? Yes. And his then last name? That same, W-I-L-E-S, Wiles. And, and he went from this area. He lived in Rotorangi. And yes. when was in Korea? I think I'm not 50, 51, 52, I'm not sure, but also, Bob, you may know more. When was I he? think he went with the second reinforcement, right. so that he was, if, to the best of my knowledge, he wasn't the original draft, he went over 
after. But then he was born 1930, so he was only 20 or 21 at that mm. time. Yeah. But he was in the, the, the military corps at school yeah. beforehand, so that may be that. So your first name is Royce? R-O-Y-C-E, -E. like Rolls Royce, but no relation. <laughs> <laughs> And Beverly, yes. what do you know about the Korean War from him? Not much, Not <laughs> because much. he doesn't talk about it very much. See, that's why it becomes Forgotten War. You made it <laughs> Forgotten War. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no. Have you been to Korea with him? No. No, no, not at all. What about Royce? Have you been to Korea? No, I haven't. No. Oh. Now the Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs, they are inviting back their family, remaining surviving family, back to Korea. So if you are interested in, you can talk to VA office here. What do you know about the Korean War that your father fought for? Maybe not some good things, because I know he never ate rice again. Oh, tell me. Why? <laughs> why? Why? He said the rice was so bad that they ate there. I don't know the detail. He didn't talk about it much. But he liked his New Zealand food and his roast potatoes, so he didn't like the food. He said there was a lot of violence. Um, maybe it was a bit rough. Um, really, I don't know the details. It was before my parents met, so I don't know much more. Um, he, every year, he went to the RSA function for Anzac Day. So the K-Force group was very strong. Mm. The New Zealand RSA is quite a strong group. I don't know. Well, yeah. Within New Zealand RSA, how is the K-Force regarded, just as...? Uh, for a long time, they weren't. When I first became secretary of the, um, the RSA, someone objected to a Korean veteran being the secretary. And they pointed out that I had served overseas in World War II. Otherwise, they would have objected to my appointment. So you were seen as second class after the Second War? Yeah. Not as good as the Second oh, War? With, with RSA considered the K-Force uh, men as second class members. Ah. Hmm. Hey, so what do you know? Any, do you know anything about Korea now, South Korea? The economy or society, culture, anything? Absolutely. What do you know? Tell me. I've worked in Kabul for nine years. So Kabul? I used to have lunch with one of the Korean embassy staff. W where do you work? Kabul, Afghanistan. I went as a volunteer, as a civilian. Ah. So I used to have lunch with one of the Korean embassy staff, whom I won't name. Uh -huh. I know he was furious with the slow internet. Mm. Because <laughs> Korea had super fast internet and he was going very... He had a lot of trouble adjusting to a slow speed of internet outside Korea. Mm. Um, I know it's highly developed. I know they have a major industry and lots of K-pop and you have all that stuff, you know, and um, no, I haven't been there. I mean, I study, I know the Buddhist history of Korea more than I know the, the military history. Mm. That's different. So you were hearing what uh, Bob is saying about the Korea 1951 to 52 and the Korea that he saw in 2004 and 2000. Six, what do you think about this whole transformation, but still is forgotten and not many people really, not much covered in our history education? In New Zealand, Asia is, was ignored a long time. Mm. It's never part of it. And even then we studied, when I went to school in the 60s, we studied Japan again and again, but never Korea. Mm. So maybe that was... Still when was it? In the 1960s. Even 1960s. We studied every year Japan. But maybe because the, 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 the second war loomed so great. Exactly. Whereas Korea was like a, a side act mm -hmm. for the world. So maybe that. Um, so what was the question again? Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think about this whole transformation? And uh, we don't you know, teach about it. And we don't talk about it. And how we can overcome this? Can we? I'm not sure the... When I was growing up, made in Japan or made in Hong Kong was derogatory. Mm. And then it became fantastic. You wanted those. 
and now Korea's come into that same category. You buy a Korean car, it's never going to break down. So you can see that trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think... No, I've got too much to say on that. I'll better shut up. So this is what we made. Show it to the camera. And that's... Uh, could you read it? Korea's place in teaching world history. Yes. That's the book that we published, my foundation, World History Digital Education Foundation, with the NCSS National Council for Social Studies. It's the biggest social studies teachers association in the United States. And teaching about modern Korea, you know, how Korean economy was growing like so speedy and so successfully. And as you mentioned, the internet and all this digital technology in Korea is fascinating. So we created lesson plan and primary and secondary resources about those two and two topics and we are training social studies teachers in the United States. That's what we want to do here in, in New Zealand. Okay, So we want to create lesson plans so that teachers can teach about the Korean War even tomorrow after reading this. And that's why I'm going to have a series of meetings with the scholars and professors and teachers in New Zealand so that they can learn about Bob Chesum. What do you think? Do you think it's feasible? Absolutely, because we shouldn't lose the lesson. Mm -hmm. And so to capture it, and Bob, I've never heard Bob talk about the war like that. So that was interesting as well. So okay. yes, that's a very good opportunity to capture things from someone who's 94. Yeah. Yeah. You look like a 64. <laughs> and Especially on this. Well. He feels 104. Oh. <laughs> I've looked after him well. You are too ambitious. You want to be like uh, no, 24. His father lived to his 100th year. Oh. So he wants to be the same, yes? Yeah. I always thought I would, but. Uh, yeah, why not? Why not? <laughs> See, look at it. You never heard of him speaking on the Korean War like this, right? So when young children in New Ze schools in New Zealand, like here, Rotorangi, Rot Rot do you think children might be interested in knowing more about the war that he fought for? Do you think? What do you think? I don't really know. Mm. Technology may be more interesting to them than some history, okay. but also the teachers are not interested. The teachers are the key to get it through. Exactly. They have to have, develop an interest and do something like that. Exactly. That's why we want to provide this lesson plan so that they can teach. And then we're going to have a conferences to train them and make them interested in this topic. But Korea is, Korean culture is much more than the history of the war. Exactly. I'm sorry. There's a whole lot of other stuff there. Is Korean taught in New Zealand? I don't know. No. You tell me. I don't think so. It used to be taught in Australia in one place, but it may be stopped. So that's why this book doesn't have any topic about the war, but after the war. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's what we are trying to do. And if you know of any social studies teacher here might be interested in doing this together with my foundation, we are hiring them and paying them to do work, writing lesson plan by the teachers for the teachers and so that they can talk about the, Korea with their young students. Billy Dillon wasn't a teacher. I think it's better to ask the teachers what they need exactly. than us say, well, here's what we want to give you, mm -hmm. if you understand the yep. point. Yep. Your mm -hmm. point is great, and that's what we are trying to do. Mm -hmm. We want to approach and connect with the teachers. So if you know of anybody, please tell me, okay? Let me know. Sure. Sir, Bob, you are a proud Korean War veteran. For the 70th anniversary of the Korean War, it's actually ridiculous because it's been 70 years. That war has not really finished. We are technically at war, but we have to commemorate the 70th anniversary. What would you say to the world about the war that you fought for, that it's become 70th? Yeah, well, when I joined the, Korea, the war, my terms of service where I'm available for service for the duration of the war and six months afterwards. Mm. So theoretically, I could be called back into the service 
the Korea. <laughs> Perhaps if I knew that in North Korea, that might bring them to the peace table. No. <laughs> Look at this 94-year-old soldier spirit. Wow, you can bring him down. <laughs> Amazing, sir. He's so cheeky. <laughs> wow. You will go well over 110. How about that? Yes. Any other message you want to leave it to this uh, leave to this interview? No, I think that a lot is being done now, and especially for the education of Korean veterans' children and grandchildren. And I think that continuing relationship with Korea is fantastic because. Having seen what the Koreans had and what they have now, New Zealand has a stake in Korea and they should foster it. Mm. What a beautiful interview it is. Thank you so much, Bob, for your fight. And we never forget and we will make sure that this will get into the classroom so that young New Zealanders will learn from you, will listen from you, okay? Thank you, and take care of that bandage soon, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Great.